been on review of the Onkyo TX-NR727 home cinema receiver. We're going to talk to you about the different features of this home cinema receiver, the components that are inside it, the setup menus, and we're going to tell you, most importantly, what we think it sounds like and what it's like to use. So the 727 uh, is uh, this year's uh, replacement to last year's 717 and they've changed the range around quite a bit because the model below the 66 uh, is, is now doesn't have THX but this one does have THX on it. Uh, it has other little things like this uh, illumination around the volume uh, control and generally just a bit better built. It's also a deeper chassis than the model below um, and it also has an uprated power supply which we'll talk to you about a bit in, in, in a while. Now it has eight HDMI inputs. The front one here is doubles up. It's also an MHL, so you can use that with uh, portable devices like mobile phones to play videos back on. And it's rated at 170 watts according to Onkyo, but that is only with one channel driven at six ohms and at one kilohertz, so it's a little bit misleading. They do say in their specifications that uh, with just two channels driven at eight ohms, it's 130 watts. Uh, so that's more realistic if you're using it in stereo. But for home cinema use, it's probably well below 100 watts per channel. So slightly misleading for them to say, oh, it's 170 watts, because it, it's just it's just not. Uh, it has a variety of different inputs. Uh, it has a component input, which it will look convert that to HDMI. And it has 4K scaling. And this year's model as well will pass through a 4K um, signal too, which uh, last year's model, we believe, didn't. Yeah, now comes with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in, which on uh, the previous model and most things on the market, uh, there are optional extras, but this one it has it built in, so you don't have to buy any dongles or mess around in that way. It also frees up that front USB port, so you can use it for flash sticks or a portable hard drive or something like that that you want to plug into it. Now onto the rear panel. You can see uh, here that all those HDMI's, it also has twin HDMI outputs, uh, which you can use to uh, have like a screen and uh, a projector in the same rooms. Uh, it only outputs the on-screen menus though through one of them, not both of them. So uh, you, you can only see them through that. It has one optical input, two coaxial inputs, Quite a few uh, analog inputs, including uh, a unusually for this price point, a phono input for a turntable, two subwoofer preouts, and here you can see all the different speaker connections. Now we always recommend using banana plugs, uh, but they do come with these little plastic bungs in the back, so you can pull them out with a, a screw. Uh, it's a lot neater connection. It doesn't oxidise up like a, like having bare wire, and it's a lot. Uh, neater, you know, a lot more tidy around the back, and of course, a lot quicker if you ever want to move the amplifier or anything like that. You can just pull all the banana plugs out and, and move it, whereas you have to spend time doing this and un unscrewing each terminal. Now we're going to take the lid off the Onkyo TX NR727 and show you the different components that make it up. Now inside you can see there's that giant fan uh, and that only comes on at uh, high volumes or when the unit gets quite hot so you can't hear it ordinarily uh, at low volumes it doesn't even come on. This main green board here is the sort of heart uh, of the of the amplifier. It's 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 where all the video processing seems to be on all the sound processing all the HDMI sockets all uh, terminate onto that board. Towards the front of the amp you can see the main capacitors there they smooth out the uh, that they get currents and give it some extra uh, ability to cope with peaks in, in current demand. The heatsink here is a much better heatsink than in the model below. It's a lot chunkier uh, design. Things like the, the screws, you can see that they're better quality screws on those little uh, output modules that are bolted to the heatsink. This is the back of the front panel. Um, you can see on the left hand side there was the, the, there's the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth receiver. I believe that's what that is. And the power supply in this, because it's THX rated, uh, because it's a bit more powerful than the model below, is a is a bit. It seems a bit to be a bit chunkier than the one uh, below it in the range. And the whole chassis is about two inches deeper than the six two six below it. 
So you are getting a, a lot more for your money. You're getting different components, better heatsink, better power supply, and it, it has you know it's got more more stuff in it because it is it is that little bit deeper. I think as well. I haven't looked, and I think the capacitors seem to be slightly bigger in this as well as main capacitors. That middle bit in in the bit, those little orange uh, things that look like a screwdriver going. That, that's they. That's where they trim up each uh, volume for each uh, amp, each channel, and it has seven channels in it, so seven amps going all the way along there. Now this is what you get inside the box. The um, instructions, uh, the main instruction manual comes on a CD-ROM. This is the remote control. Uh, and this can control various different components as well. You can make this um, make this work with, with different manufacturers' devices, whether it's a, a Panasonic television, for instance, or something like that. And we'll, we'll show you that how to do that in the setup menu. Actually, you do choose which ones you want in the... Um, in the amps menu you don't have to look through any kind of code book or anything like that that's the odyssey uh room correction setup microphone a power lead that's the am and fm aerials and it's quite handy as well what you get in the box are these little stickers that you can put on all your speaker connections to help identify them uh, so if you do pull them all out and move your receiver like we were saying you can find which one's which again uh with with some ease now this is the setup menu, this is the first menu on there and uh, this is where you set up uh, the input and output. This is sets up where which one you want the to be the monitor output for HDMI, uh, which one has the on-screen graphics. You can set the resolution whether it's 4K, 1080p, 720, uh, that you want everything to be scaled to because it, it has got a scaler built in. Here you can decide which of the HDMI inputs are assigned to which input name. And you can do the same with the, the one component uh, video input that it has too. The digital audio inputs, you can also configure which, which uh, inputs they are assigned to. Uh, so if you've got a CD player uh, that you want to use with it or something like that, you can, you can say you, know, you want it on CD rather than on Blu-ray. Into the speaker settings, uh, you can choose the different impedance, whether 4 ohms or 8 ohms. You can choose whether you want to bi-amp the front channels or use those, if you're only using it as 5.1, you can use the sixth and seventh channels for that, so you can buy amps, so you can increase, increase the sound quality through your front speakers, or you can use it for, to power a zone two, uh, uh, like your kitchen or a bedroom. You you can have those as uh, extra speaker channels to be used for that with an independent source selection and independent volume. This is where you can set the different frequency bands for each channel, each speaker. Now, if you've got full size speakers, we recommend setting it to that, to full size, and then cutting it down if you're using a subsat system and setting it up where the roll off on the, uh, on the subwoofer kicks in and the, the satellites uh, stop, you know, it cuts the bass off to stop the frequencies at that certain uh, frequency threshold. Here you set the different distances from each, from where your prime listening position is and the level calibration same sort of idea now the odyssey does do this for you um but we we always recommend trying to do it manually as well just to see what you think sounds best you can there's also a manual equalizer so you can switch that on and play around with uh, with the different frequencies you shouldn't have to do this if you've got the right speakers to match up with the receiver we don't think it's very hi-fi to then equalize it uh, it's not something we would recommend we're, we're sort of purists in that so we would leave that off could come in handy if you've maybe got different make of center speaker and front speakers and they sound radically different but ideally you want the same make of center speaker and front speakers you don't want different different ones here's some of the thx settings that you can adjust with it being a thx select receiver Now you've got various different audio settings you can you can utilize for each of the different sound modes. So you've got some general Dolby ones, uh, you've got some general DTS ones.
all of these controls you don't have to do this as soon as you get the receiver um, the vast majority of these, these things you can do at a later date the main things you need to do are in the speaker settings you need to tell it which speakers you're actually using and which amps you want to assign for different things these are all things you can come back to uh, you know at your leisure and adjust here's where you can adjust the volume for each input uh, which can be quite useful if you've got something that's a bit quiet like a satellite receiver uh, where the volume's lower you can boost that for each input this is where you can synchronize if you've got uh, some lip sync errors so the sound is slightly out of sync uh, with the video because maybe your television does overly process it or some things actually are out of sync by default you know they just don't work properly some satellite receivers here you can adjust it and it i believe it does that on a on a, it does that on an input uh, by input uh, basis so I won't do it across all of them, I'll just do it for the, that input. You can rename the inputs here as well to make them more uh, user friendly. There's some picture adjustment settings as well where you can turn off various different enhancements. I'd recommend turning these off. If you've got a good television and a good Blu-ray player as a source, you shouldn't need to do this, but you might have some older sources such as a, a laser disc player or something really old uh, or VHS machine that you might feel needs a little bit of tweaking. You can do that. It's here. And again, it's on an input uh, by input basis, so it won't do everything. Here you can set the different listening modes as to what they should be when, whenever you switch, whenever it gets that sort of source. By default, it's just whatever the last valid uh, input was set to, but you can fix it in stone so it always does a certain thing. The volume, you can have it counting up in minus dB, or which is the relative THX value, or you can just have it a number zero all the way up to, I think, 80. Um, we'd recommend having it in minus dB because zero dB is full volume, and that's where if you go past that with, a, with an input signal that's zero dB, you will start to damage your speakers and potentially your receiver as well for sure so uh, we recommend having it that and never going above zero here are the different languages you've got in it as well it does have a screen saver too that kicks in and you can adjust uh, how that's set up how many minutes that comes on after if it's detecting no source there's various different settings here for the HDMI and they're related to uh, CEC or HDMI control um, this can be problematic with some televisions and some of the bits of equipment. So if you're having problems, turn it off. Um, it can cause incompatibility issues. It can just be as simple as it's just plain annoying. You, know, you go to turn your TV on or you turn the receiver off and it always turns one or the other off or sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It's not a fault of the Onkyo. It just seems that, that the main system uh, doesn't work. We have this problem with lots of different receivers and we just generally recommend turning it off. But it can be useful for some different types of uh, control systems that work with it correctly. In the networking here you can adjust the Bluetooth, you can set the Bluetooth up uh, and you can also uh, choose whether you want it to be wireless, wireless or wired connection and manually specify uh, the IP address which is a, again a good idea if you're having problems on your networking to set a static IP address. So here is where you can set the remote ID. If you have more than one of these units in the same place, uh, you can make sure they don't uh, you know, control each other by setting the remote ID. You do that on the remote as well. You have to change it. It does explain that in the instructions. And this is a really, really clever feature, and I, I think unique to Onkyo, where you can look up the uh, brand of devices you have that, you, that uh, you're using. So if you've got a Panasonic television, and it will search an internal database that's built into the the receiver and then it will transmit codes back to the remote control and you can try it out and if it works you can then control your television with the OnKids remote you don't have to look in any code books you don't have to do any teaching of the codes you just it just does it it's very very clever you can also lock the setup so that people can't fiddle around with it uh, once you've got it all how you want it lock it up so no one else can uh, can play around now this is the um, home menu this is where you get into the setup menu and this is also where you, you can view the insta preview and this uh, previews the different inputs now uh, don't worry too much about the what's going on in the background here with it being a bit jittery that's just our capture card that we use to capture this but you can see there the little thumbnails that you have down the bottom uh, they come up and they show you uh, what's going on on the different different in, various different inputs and it doesn't they they are just a few frames per second they don't, they don't they don't show you in real time but it's quite useful you can see what's going on especially if you've got a lot of inputs 
Now, other things in the home menus, the firmware update ability, you can go straight to the networking and you can also browse files on the USB. This is the Q menu. Uh, there's a Q button on the remote control and this gives you various information about what's on different inputs. It also gives you a little thumbnail as well of what's going on on that input um, other than the one you're on. And it, you can you can also quickly change various different modes without having to fumble around with the actual remote control. Uh, so you can change things like the bass and treble, uh, the subwoofer le level if you want to give it a bit of a boost. It's sometimes quiet on some films, so that's quite a useful thing to have easy access to, not having to go into the full setup menu. And it also displays some information about what's coming in and what's going out, audio and video. So you can see there's 1080i uh, signal coming in and 1080i signal going out again. You can also change the current listening mode, uh, which there are four buttons that let you toggle through this on the remote, but this lets you see them all, all the different modes uh, before you actually change them over. Now we're going to show you the internet radio function on here. Now, previously with Onkyo, they've used a service provider called uh, VTuner, uh, but they've now switched across to using uh, one called TuneIn. Now, it works pretty much the same way. It's got the same sort of selection of stations as before that we can see. So it's got all, most of the ones here in the UK, certainly all the national stations. It, it's just as quick, it seems, to navigate. So you click on here on, on Classic FM. And it will bring up a piece of uh, artwork, whether it's the album art, the picture of the DJ, or maybe even the uh, logo uh, of the station. It depends on what the station wants to actually use, I think, as to what comes out there. Uh, it has the uh, BBC uh, national stations, and it seems to have most of the local ones as well. So a huge selection. I mean, there must be hundreds, if not thousands, of stations on here worldwide that you can go to. Um, and so it's certainly much more than you'd ever get from its built-in uh, FM and AM radio. Another feature uh, of its networking is uh, the ability to stream music using Spotify. Now, for this, you have to have a Spotify premium account, uh, which you have to pay for. But you can search for any piece of music on here and... Most of the time, it will bring up quite a lot. So we're going to search for ABBA. You can do all this via the app as well, via their control app. You don't have to do it using the on-screen graphics. You could have your television actually turned off. You can even do it from the front screen panel as well. Uh, you can see it's brought up an awful lot of different uh, ABBA tracks there. Obviously, it's not as good as streaming back FLAC you know, or uh, PCM because it is compressed, but it's a huge selection of music, which you know turns it into a, a giant jukebox, really. Um, and it's great for sort of background music, or if you're having a, a party or something like that, you can, you can just put on whatever anyone wants, pretty much. So it is a useful feature, but you do have to pay for that. You have to subscribe, and it's not available everywhere in the world. It's certainly available here in the UK. There's new music on there as well. It's a good way of finding new music uh, if, you want to, if you like something, and then go out and buy the you know proper high quality version of it now something that's at the moment unique it seems to onkyo uh, is the ability to play tracks from a networked drive and they call it home media so just using windows networking or just a uh, nas drive that doesn't support dlna you can share your media files and then just browse them like you would on your home network we're showing you in the bottom left hand corner what the front display looks like. So you can see you can do all this via the front display. You don't need to be using your television. So here it's playing some uh, 192 kilohertz 24 bit FLAC files. And it starts up again fairly quickly. And these could be, these, these are just the equivalent really as if you were putting a USB stick in it as well, in that you're just browsing it at how it's stored on your on your network. So if it's all a mess, it'll be all a mess. If it's nice and tidy in lots of folders, then it'll be in lots of tidy lots of folders. The other advantage of this as well uh, is that it can also, it's the only way across your network at the moment that you can play DSD files. Although I, I do believe there is a 
DLNA compatible um, uh, NAS drive coming onto the market to serve up DSD files as well. So we haven't had a chance to try that out to see if the Onkyo can work with that, but theoretically you could do it with that one. But um, here, here you can see we're just we're just just demonstrating that it will do DSD files as well. You can see we've got a folder full of DSD with some DSD music in, and there's a few tracks in there, a few albums in there. It won't play an an ISO copy of a D of an SACD disc though. They do have to be converted into the actual individual DSD files. It would be nice if it could just play back <laughs> the whole ISO, but it doesn't do that. And DLNA menu works in, a, in this, much the same way. So if you've got some DLNA software running on your computer, which I think Windows Vista 7 and 8 have all got built in anyway, although they don't share a wide variety of files, so they don't do things like WAV files, and um, I don't think they do FLAC either. So you're better off with a standalone NAS drive, which is what we're using here. And this works with pretty much everything apart from, like I say, the DSD files. It doesn't show those up. But that is down to the actual NAS drive rather than the Onkyo, we think. Um, and but it but it will work with WAV files. Fairly quick to to bring up a list then starts playing and it takes a few seconds for the uh, album art to then come up as well because it's pulling that across uh, the network so this is the Onkyo control app now we have a, a, a few problems with this first of all on our particular tablet that you can see we're using here you can't actually access the volume at the bottom it doesn't come up for whatever reason it's it's obscured by the um, time and the, the, the actual action bar on the bottom so you can't adjust the volume on it so that's the first drawback the other problem with it is it's really big we're using it here on a nine inch tablet and uh everything's designed for a phone so but, but they don't they don't it doesn't know that the apps are dumb it, it, it thinks that we're using it on a phone and it and it it just makes everything really big um, unnecessarily big you know all the inputs could easily be on one page if you wanted a page full of inputs or these could even be in a separate little window they don't need to be here but it does have the advantage in that you can do things like you can access Spotify, all the things we've just showed you in the networking. And it works probably just as quick as it does doing the remote, but it's easier for you to, to understand what's going on. It's clear, clear laid out. But still, it's only showing us four tracks there. on the, And we've got this huge screen area. Um, it's really quite wasteful. Um, and without the volume control on our particular tablet, it's quite useless um, because that's the core thing that you want to be able to do is turn the volume up and down usually. It does have the feature as well that you can choose things that are actually on the tablet to stream to using DLNA to the receiver. That's that thing down the bottom left with the little um, uh, musical note. Uh, and you can see here, you can browse up something nice. But again, it's so, so big uh, and huge. Um, and even even the basic controls of uh, trying to control the receiver, like the setup menu, take up too much. Uh, just take up too much space. They're unnecessarily large. It can bring back album art, although it's very very poor quality. Um, and we're guessing it's picking this up because the receiver does actually send this when it's whatever it's playing. It sends it over the network to anything that's listening. But it is quite a small version of the album art. Whereas if the software on on the here actually called to the NAS drive, it could get the full a larger version of the album art. So there's not a variety of improvements, but you can see here all the controls are the traveling base. It's just too too big.
But there is a, a third party solution now, um, and we've tested it with uh, the 626 model below and this 727, and it does work with it. This is called My AV uh, Home Control. And the advantage of this is that uh, not only does it um, control the on -key better, uh, in that you've got access to all your controls down the bottom left, your sound modes uh, in the middle at the bottom, all the different inputs that are on the receiver. And the volume control is always there on, at the left and right. No slide out menus. You can't accidentally slide up to full volume. It, it brings back more, more, uh, more information as well. It does all those things, but it also will control other components. So with some things like Panasonic television, it can control that. Um, it can control a Virgin box. It will control different brands of Blu-ray players like Pioneer. It will also control different AV receivers. It will do Onkyo, Pioneer, uh, Yamaha, uh, Denon, and Marantz, and Sony. So it does, it does a, quite a few different brands of AV receiver as well as this one. And here you can see on its television menu, you can move the channels around, delete the ones you don't want. It's got icons for them. It's, it's a much better solution, and we're going to be doing a full review of that soon. Now, on to the pros and cons for the TX-NR727. It's uh, a big step up in price from the model below, but we feel that that's justified from the audio performance. The mid-range uh, and vocals uh, are much, much improved, especially for music. But even watching a film through it out of the centre channel, you do get a clear, much clearer response than the model below. Uh, we've not we've not done a direct comparison yet with other receiver any of the other manufacturers receivers at this price point, but certainly compared to the onkit below and even to last year's models from other manufacturers, we think this is a a very good buy at the price. You're getting uh, improvements in build quality, extra features, things like THX, eight HDMI inputs, the built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, things that are optional extras with other brands aren't here. Uh, it, it's got quite a wealth of things. The 4K video pass through, uh, 4K scaling. We don't know how useful that is, but it, you know it's it's on it. You don't have to worry about it. You've got it there. Uh, we, we feel that you know if, if you're if you're looking for something that's a step up from that mid range uh, variety of receivers, uh, that this is a good stepping stone to the sort of higher end receivers, and you, it's a good mix of features and sound quality. That the better power supply uh, does give it a bit more grunt. Uh, and, and better, better for through you know more more clearer dialogue through the center speakers. What we noticed uh, for films and and for music, be better better quality music. On the con side, well, it is it is more ex a lot more expensive than the model below it, and feature wise, you don't get an awful lot more uh, because the the mid range receivers these days are so feature packed that it's very hard for them to actually add things on. But, the, but what you, you do get, of course, is the better performance. And we feel that that's uh, justified in the extra price that they're asking for on Kyo. So we would say that maybe uh, on the console, it is, it is a bit more bit, bit pricey uh, for its, for, compared to the ones in the lower range. Um, but there isn't really anything that it's lacking in. So it's, it's, there's not much to go in the console at all. That's the end of our review of the Onkyo TX NR727. If you'd like to see more video reviews or you'd like to purchase one of these units, please visit our website, avlan.co.uk. Thank you very much for watching.